my name is Nikola Yazutis and I would like to talk a little bit about C++. Um, you might have heard my name. I wrote some books and <coughs> give, gave some talks and sometimes I complain. Um, it's all my fault because I'm involved in C++ programming since 25 years now. So I was even involved when we standardized C++ 98, so the first C++ standard, I was there. And, but we are 100 people, so I'm only 1% of the problems. <laughs> and um, you know what? We have a really big problem now because at the next meeting we will be 160 people to <coughs> adopt C++ 20. So yeah, we have a problem. We are too successful, victims of our own success. Uh, so it's time for you to learn that C++ is bad, worse, and you shouldn't use it. And that's the goal of this talk this evening. Yeah, you learn, don't use C++, it's a nightmare. You got the lesson? Okay. Good. The talk is called the nightmare of initialization in C++ and it's partially created because I currently teach at BMW here in Munich a couple of 200 guys, um, girls and uh, men, girls, women and men, so that's a correct behavior, you have to be careful these days, <laughs> um, we, who want to learn C++ or understand how you implement C++ code in a proper way. And it turns out that the first thing we talked about was when we teach them about how to initialize an object, we had a long discussion. So how should we initialize a C++ object? And this talk is just about this topic. And so let's see where it goes. We have something invented in C++11 which is called uniform initialization. So why do we have that? Because initialization in C++ was a mess. In C++03 or 98, which was the old C++. So adopted from C, we were able to initialize an int without a value, which means it is not initialized, it has an undefined value if it's on the stack. We were able to initialize this int with a floating point value by using the equal sign, which means the int gets a value 42, which is pretty obvious to almost everybody except those who try to understand C++. <laughs> and we have another way adopted from C, which is how to initialize an array. Well, we're using an equal sign and curly braces. And then we introduced with C++ 98, with the first standard, a way to initialize objects with parentheses. So, well, consistency looks different. This is more, I would say, each and every kind of type should have its own way to getting initialized. Well, for that reason we said, oh no, wait a minute, we can now initialize an int with parentheses. Um, we can also, because sometimes we need that in generic code, initialize an int by its default value. Also, there is no default value, but there is a default value with you just use empty parentheses, which is zero for the fundamental data types and oh, too much too bad for vectors we don't have a way to give initial values that was the situation we had and it was not that we had different ways to initialize an object we also had a very complicated terminology so we had, for example, a distinction between copy initialization and direct initialization. If you directly initialize something, you don't use an equal sign. If you copy initialize something, you have an equal sign. You see it on the right. And just for fun, 
or some people say just to confuse the Russians, we have different rules for that. Okay. And then we have default initialization, zero initialization, value initialization. And then we have list initialization and aggregate initialization. All different terminology we use in the standard to describe under what rules we can initialize an object. I'm pretty sure here everybody knows about the rules. But just in case there's somebody new here in this room, let's go a little bit into the details. Before we do that, let's talk about the general theme of this talk. The general theme is that we have a problem, a nightmare. It's not the first nightmare for those who have seen earlier talks of me. And by the way, last time I proposed this talk at CppCon, they asked me, hey, can you be somehow positive about C++? <laughs> I answered in a long email, but the essence was no, <laughs> because we are doing it wrong. And the problem is we have these problems, and we have these problems if you teach them to beginners. What should we teach? How should we initialize an object? So we have different syntaxes, different terminology, and different rules. And the goal in C++11 was make, uni make initialization uniform. Somebody's laughing here. <laughs> Why that? <laughs> so, there's a side effect, which is we have to be backward compatible. I mean, C++ is a software project in every set. We, we release versions like C++11. We have to be backward compatible because we have customers already using C++. So we have constraints against what things we can change. Especially, we still have to adopt the rules of C++ and the binary representation of objects of C++. So we have a problem in this software. And the good or bad thing is it becomes worse and worse because we have more and more features in this language, as you will see. So yes, our goal was to make initialization uniform, but the problem is we have to be backward compatible. So we're still the mess. We still have the mess we had before. We just extend the mess by something uniform. Which sometimes just increases the mess. So where did we come to in C++11? In C++11 we said, OK, let's use the curly braces for each and every initialization. So what that means is, of course, we are backward compatible, so this all works. We can initialize an int without having a value. We can initialize an int by an equal sign. We can initialize an int by parentheses. We can initialize an int by calling um, int with empty parentheses, which initializes it with zero, or yields the value of zero. But in addition, we now have curly braces. So we can now initialize an int with curly braces with some value or with no value, like an i7 here, which is more or less corresponding to i4 before. And we can use, of course, equal signs also. And again, with curly braces, with some value to initialize and some value not. Uh, are not giving a value to initialize. So we have eight different ways to initialize an int. Is this all? No. We come to that in a moment, but just to make sure that you understand what uniform initialization means, we said everything can be initialized now with curly braces, and you don't need the equal sign. So that means if you have a raw array, you have an array of an, some int values, you can now skip the equal sign. And that means if you have a class, an object of a class, this class object can now be initialized also with curly braces instead of the parentheses. And of course with an equal sign. And the good thing is, for vectors, 
we now can initialize the vectors with curly braces to give some initial values to this vector. Um, which might be some strings or might be some integers even computed on the fly. But, uh, and of course with equal signs. So this is the uniform solution we have now. I think it raises a little bit the question, what should we teach? So which one of these ways of initialization should we teach to beginners to initialize an object with? And that was exactly the point when he started to say, let's teach 200 programmers, modern C++, some coming just from C, and teach them how to initialize a C++ object with it, more or less an issue of the second hour in your training course. Okay, the good thing with this is a couple of things that were mad before, now I get easy. So if you had a multi-map of strings and strings, so we map here English words to German words, before C++11 you had to do something like this, insert of make pair of day to talk and that could be now written by just initialize the multi-map of English words mapped to German words by just using curly braces. That's good. That's definitely a benefit. So, however, it turned out that we have now a couple of ways to initialize an int. So we have the four ways we just talked about, which we adopted from the world before we had C++11. <laughs> then with C++11 we introduced the four ways to in initialize an int with curly braces. So we have eight ways now. Then there's an interesting issue. We can declare the object to be auto and be initialized as an int because the value we take for initialization is an int, which um, usually works unless you put the 42 in parentheses, uh, ex excuse me, in curly braces. There we made a mistake and we will come to that later. And we can use um, equal sign here, where we also have some interesting effects. <laughs> and put an int here. And the moment I prepared this slide, so I had 12 different ways to initialize an int. I thought, oh, are there more? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, there are. <clears throat> well, let's try parentheses. <laughs> So what is this? Oh, that, that initializes an int. No, wait. This is declares a function. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> so let's take this. Is this initializing an int? Is this valid C++ or not? It's not? Who thinks it's not? One. Who thinks this is valid C++? It's a compile time error. <laughs> <laughs> So let's put a parenthesis in front of the. Uh, let's put an assignment operator or assignment character in front of this parenthesis. Is this valid code or not? Who thinks this is valid C? Who thinks it isn't? It is. It initialized I15 by 9 because this on the right side is a comma operator. So we have here valid initialization. M maybe not the intention you have. So if we explicitly write int here, is this okay? This is a compile time error, of course. <laughs> it's obvious that this is a compile time error, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we love C++. Huh? <laughs> Auto, taking two arguments, what happens there with auto? <laughs> it's a compile time error. It's, it's, it's the same rules apply. So if you use an equal sign, it will compile with auto. And without um, an equal sign or with expressly specifying int here, it doesn't work. 
But the problem is, whenever this compiles, this is a comma operator, so it initializes the int with the second value of this comma separated list. So do we like that? No. <laughs> Don't use parentheses to initialize an int. That's the first thing we learn. Good. 19 ways to initialize an int. Six of them are bad. Good. So we only have 12 left. Let's talk about these 12 cases. Good. Auto. <clears throat> Let's initialize an auto int i9 by 42. Yeah, this works, it's fine. It takes the thing on the right, the, the, the value and the type on the right to initialize the int. And however, what happens if we have curly braces here? We made a mistake in C11. We thought this is a cool way to create an initializer list of ints, which is not as an int. So the type of i10 would not be an int here. Although almost everybody thought this would be the case because auto says, hey compiler, you find out what the type is. We initialize i10 by 42, so i10 should be an int. But it isn't. And we, we made that mistake. So this is fixed, this mistake. It was fixed formally in C++ um, 14. And um, it essentially is fixed in a couple of compiler versions. So if you switch to Clang 3.8 or to GCC 5 or to Visual Studio 15, then the behavior of this expression will change. It will still compile, but it will be that i10 is now an int, it was before an initializer list of int, which is something different. It's one of the few cases where we change behavior between different compilers and not just disabling behavior. So this is an int unless you use an old compiler. Well, old. <laughs> I heard that some people use versions older than these compilers. <laughs> yeah, so be careful with that. And um, if we use an equal sign here, just for fun, we said this is still an initializer list of int. <laughs> this was one of the craziest decisions we ever did in C++. Because that means that the type of an object initialized depends on whether you use an equal sign or not. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> An equal sign in initialization might change the type of what you initialize? Are we totally crazy and screwed up? It happens if you standardize a language by a community and you need compromises. This is a result of a compromise. Some people needed a way to, in template code to initialize an object as an initializer list of a value. And they said, but if you take us this option away, we can no longer write this template code. So what do we do in politics? <laughs> we make a compromise. And the compromise means that we say, okay, got it. If we don't use C equal sign, this is an int. If we use an equal sign, this is an initializer list of int. Standardization. A <laughs> hundred people are standardizing C++. We have no chief architect. I wish I could do that. <laughs> C++ would be, look different. <laughs> Maybe not better. I made some mistakes in the past. This is what we have now. And this might change. We all agree that this was a mistake. No, not all. <laughs> there are these guys at Google who think this was a great feature. The problem with Google is they rule the standardization a lot. They have a lot of people there, but they have their own vision of things. In our community, we have a problem. The problem is we think Google does it right. <laughs> we even think they are not evil, which is totally <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but we think they do it right. And yes, usually they are smart, but their problem is 
they are always smart and they can't think about people not being smart <laughs> and not knowing these rules and therefore they think this is a cool idea to have this distinction which I think is totally crazy some applause <laughs> That was forced applause, that doesn't count. <laughs> Let's see, you can do better. <laughs> okay, good. Um, just don't get me wrong. I like the Google guys in the standardization process. They are very smart. But we have a problem. We have a community of different projects and different programmers. And not everybody is as smart as the other guy. So I, I really like simple rules and a rule that says an equal sign in the initialization changes the type of the object being initialized is totally crazy. This will prop hopefully change. <laughs> the problem is that people need some way to express this in template code so there might come in some C++ version, maybe it's C++23 way to initialize an initializer list generically by taking the values of some initial values by saying SCD initializer list of auto we can declare which is not possible right now so that we can say in a declaration we have partially said what is a type but not completely said what is a type therefore if we use auto here please deduce this element type according to the initial value and once we have that, then probably this will go away. And by the way, we are discussing that if we have that, we will also be able to do that. To have an auto array initialized by 42 saying this is an array and the elements are ints because we initialize it with one or more ints. And if we have that, then this will probably become an error. We will not make this valid to be an int we will just say this will no longer compile. This is looking in the future and that's very dangerous in C++. We thought in C++11 we would have concepts. <laughs> we might have them in C++20 very differently. So you never know but if this happens yeah, we will have probably one big problem solved that means that this strange behavior that an equal sign influences the type of an object in an initialization will be gone. But it means that in general the recommendation to use an equal sign is crap. Don't use an equal sign in an initialization because it doesn't work with auto. So good another option eliminated 11 left don't use an equal sign good what else do we have well there are this fraction which says yes you should use auto but maybe what you initialize is what you describe on the right this fraction has this pseudonym AAA, -A -A, triple A, which has almost always auto. And it came up a couple of years ago because Herb Setter gave a great talk at CppCon. And all people were said, oh, now finally we have the initialization problem solved. Just use AAA -A -A and we have no problems at all anymore in C. That's not C++. There are no easy solutions for any problem. Never. So the idea was, which Herb claimed in 2013, was whenever we initialize something, whether it's a type or whether it's a value, we use roughly the same way to initialize things. We say if it's a value, we write auto, the name of the thing, and then we say this is the initial value. If it's a type, we use using and then the name of the thing and then after an equal sign the, the, the initial value and the type and the value derive from the thing on the right. 
So instead of writing int i equals 42, let's write auto i equals 42. Instead of writing long v 42, let's use auto v equals 42 l, because the thing on the right has to be a long. And if we use a customer, we write auto c equals customer of Jim and 77, and the same for a vector const iterator where we should use, of course, c begin because for a const iterator we need c begin instead of begin. That was the rough idea. And one of the compelling arguments here is you can't forget to initialize. If you forget to initialize, it will not compile. So there's some benefit of this approach. Well, let's see. These are some examples, but there are more. And to be fair, when Herb proposed this, um, he already mentioned a couple of other problems that with this proposal. So the first thing is um, we had this problem with auto, um, which we solved. And then the next thing is string x equals 42. How to do that? with almost always auto. Well, that way. Auto x is initialized by 42 converted to an SCD string for which we introduced a literal operator in C++14. <coughs> this looks nice. There's only one problem. This will not compile. What's missing? Using names, there's a using declaration missing, yes. This is not a global rule. It only works if you do using namespace std literals or using namespace std, which we to some extent recommend not to do. So that's funny. I mean, we say almost always auto, it's easy, postfix s, and then we have it. But on the other hand, we recommend not to do what is necessary to do this, because this will not compile without a using declaration. So maybe it's time to make the suffix s part of the global namespace. I discussed this two weeks ago at our reflectors, and it turned out that we didn't agree on whether this is useful because we didn't agree on what the type of a literal used in a program should be. Should it be std string? std string is pretty expensive. Should it be std string view? Mm, there are some problems with string view. Or should we wait until we have another new type introduced? that just represents a string literal, which is not modifiable, etc. So we are not ready for that now. Maybe then we will have that later, but it will take another three, six, or nine years. Next problem we had with almost always auto was initializing an atomic. So if the thing on the left is initialized by an atomic int and you have an equal sign, by rules you need special support. And the same is true if you say the thing on the left should be an s to the array. Because the array, there's no cheap way to copy it. You will create a temporary array and the array will be copied to here. Well, we fix this problem that this is, does not compile and this is expensive with C17. Because in C17 we introduce a new rule which says if there is a type that has no way to copy, you can still return it. So think, look at this. We have a class here, no copy and move operations provided. So we delete the copy constructor and the move constructor. So you are not allowed to copy objects of this type. Also not to optimize copy by being a move. 
But we have it since C11, uh, 17, we have a rule saying if you create a temporary object like here in foo for calling foo and foo takes this object by value this is not a copy this is not a move this is passing initial values from here to there and the same is true if you return something if you have a function returning and temporary created object which has no name must not have a name and you return it here since C++ 17 this will compile even if no copying is provided because this is no longer a copy this is give some initial values back as a return value and use them to initialize this object or in other words Return value optimization and optimization of passing an object by value is now for temporaries mandatory. So even combining it saying let's call bar which returns a temporary object and pass this object to foo will compile although copying is not allowed. The only problem that does not work and ah by the way I should use curly braces of course here. That's my lesson. But anyway, so we have the moment we use, we need this object really as an object, we say this materializes. So look at this, we initialize R by the value returned by bar. Bar returns some initial value. This initial value is used to initialize a reference. That means a reference refers to something, so we need an object now. And for that, we introduce the ID, idea of saying, now this is the moment where we materialize this initial values to become an object. And that's something we introduced in C++11, uh, 70. This is uh, the new picture of the value system, excuse me, the value categories we have. So we have now for temporary objects, as long as you don't need them as real objects, they are not materialized, it's just some, a collection of initial values. And the moment we need them as an object, they materialize and become an X value of itself. You don't have to understand that, the compiler does. <laughs> the point is, this is, will not change things we compiled that compiled before will still compile but suddenly things that didn't compile before having the ability to return an object even if copying and moving is not allowed will now compile and this is exactly the case when we have here atomic int atomic int when we create an atomic int and use this to initialize an A we, had, we needed in the past copy support but this is no longer true because this is no longer a copy. This is take the initial value of the thing on the right to initialize A. <coughs> and the same is true for array. As to the array would be an expensive copy, but now um, it's just take the initial value of this array to initialize R. And no expensive copy operation is called at all. Good. So some problems are solved. So let's use now a long long. Let's initialize a long long and use almost always auto here. Unfortunately this doesn't compile. So this rule is broken by this. We can't say on the right side we say this get in function returns something which we convert to a long long and then make sure that the thing on the right is long long. This is simply not valid syntax. I talked to that before I gave this talk at CPPCon with her and he said, oh, this is still not allowed. <laughs> we have to change that. Yeah. So maybe we use int 64 type, which is not exactly the same. Or we use static cast of long long. If you like that, I don't know.
And then we have finally the problem with references or with more sophisticated types. The thing on the left here is a reference to a const c. So let's initialize this by using almost always auto. So what that means is on the left side we write auto and we want to make sure that by specifying something on the right side the thing on the left becomes a reference. Can we do that? No, we can't. Because this auto does not work. We can take the return value of f and cast it to a const c reference. But the thing on the left is not a const c reference. Because why? Why is this, this is the case? Because auto decays. If you declare something with auto, it decays and that means it follows the rule of value passing something by value we introduced in C. What happens if you pass an array in C to a function? It becomes a pointer. If you pass a, a const object to a function, it loses its constants. If you pass it by value. And auto follows this rule. That means if you have an int i initialized by 42 and we have a reference referring to this int i and you use this reference to initialize something declared with auto the thing on the left has not the type on the right this is a common confusion people have that they think auto means you get the, th the type of the thing on the right that's not true you get the decayed type of the thing on the right and the decay type is that you lose the constness, that you lose the referenceness, that you lose that your arrays become pointers. And that means that the v here is an int and not a reference to another reference to i. And the same is true, by the way, for other examples like if you initialize with auto and on the right side you have an array, this becomes a pointer. So if you initialize this with a string literal, which is an array of three characters, hi, h, i, and backslash zero for the end, becomes a pointer. So this has not the right type as the thing on the right, and therefore the initialization here does not work. So you can say auto r takes a static const, so something on the right side that is a reference, because auto always loses referenceness. So you have to write it that way, or you have to write it that way, depending on what your semantic is. So here, also the rule of almost always auto, use auto to initialize an object with the thing on the right is broken, or has to be extended to say it friendly. So, should we use it? Well, an interesting thought I had when I prepared this talk for CPPCon a couple of weeks ago, I thought maybe we have to change this rule and to name it AAAA, -A -A, which means always auto ampersand ampersand. <laughs> so let's always, let's replace all these autos by auto ampersand ampersand because that's okay. And it's an interesting thought experience whether it's okay in these other cases. I said it as a joke, <laughs> but one hour after the talk somebody wrote me, why is this a joke? That's a good idea. <laughs> That's one problem we have in C++. <laughs> Any idea that seems to simplify the madness and nightmare of C++ seems to be a good idea. Yeah, a couple of tweets were sent about this slide. <laughs> Let's see what happens today. Okay, so this is my take on always, always auto. I think the rule should be say always auto ampersand ampersand. By the way, the, al the almost was because of the problems with atomic and array and they are gone. So we can strike almost here. Good, but don't get me wrong, I don't like it. I, I think this reads a little bit better. So,
because of the problems we have with almost always auto, I would say strike out these four options. So let's remain with these eight. And if we discuss these remaining eight, let's see is there any benefit in using curly braces over not using curly braces. So what are the benefits of uniform initialization using curly braces? Well, a couple of things are bad. First of all, the first thing that some people argue, this doesn't look like an assignment. It's, did you ever try to explain people and they ask you, is this an assignment operator? No, it's not. It looks like an assignment, but it's not. It's just using the assignment character to initialize the thing on the left. So if we use the curly braces here, you don't get any more of this question. Another thing is here, look at this. Let's compute the hash value of an object, which in itself is a lesson you can teach in one hour. Which means this is bad, this is not good. I mean, some people claim teaching something in one hour is a good experience. But how do we create a function computing a hash value of an object? We have, because a hash function is, a, is in fact a hash function object. So what you have to do in the C++, according to the C++ standard, <coughs> if you need a function that computes a hash value, you have to create an object which you can use as a function. That means it looks like this. If you have an object, create a hash object of the type of this object. This is calling the default constructor of this type. And then take your object to now use this created hash function to compute the hash value. Obvious, huh? isn't it? So. Can we do it better? Maybe yes, but can we make more clear what happens, what, what is happening here? Yes, because parentheses look like functions calls, curly braces not. So if I write it that way, which I can do since C11, I see if I get used to it that curly braces are used to initialize an object, that this is a constructor call and then the constructor the object created by the constructor is used as a function. And it was funny when I, when I ran over this, I um, accidentally ran into a guy talking about a new feature with, that will come in C++ 20 or 23, talking about reflection. We will get reflection in C++ sooner or later. And he told me, hey Nico, can you help me? I have a problem. And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I have the following thing. I, we have a keyword that will probably come called reflex pull. I don't know how to come pronounce it. <laughs> and yeah, the, it's important to have keywords that are probably not well known function or variable names. <laughs> Seriously, because we will break existing programs. We will have this problem because we are currently thinking about introducing modules and we have a big discussion now because the word module is used in a lot of code as a lot of symbols and, we, and if we introduce this to be a keyword we will break a lot of existing programs. So this is uh, probably not breaking a lot of programs. <laughs> what they wanted to do is they want to reflect on this expression and there might be two things. You might say, can I please have reflection on what this returns or what this is? And he asked me, I'm currently got a task for my co-working group to say, how can we different this 
different situation and he was already trying to do something crazy here and I said hey wait a minute we have their way to say there's a difference if you use curly braces it's clear that's a constructor call if you use parentheses it's clear that you want to reflect on the return type of something so why don't you follow the rules we already have we have an ability to distinguish between these two things since we introduced curly braces to initialize objects and so he said oh yeah you're right we don't need a new fact language feature I knew about this because the first time I came into this problem was when I wrote the first edition of the C++ standard library in 1997 because I tried out the following program look at this vector of int v is initialized by all the values all the integer values we read from cn which was take an int it, I stream iterator for int, read from C in, this is the end iterator. So that way we take all the input of C in, as long as it's int, let's use these int to initialize the vector of int. And it turned out that <coughs> the moment you wrote that, everything was fine, <laughs> but when I print out the size of the vector, I get a compile time error. Why that? Why the hell that? Because this V did not declare a vector of int. It did declare V to be a function having the return type vector of int. And the the function had two, two parameters. The first parameter was an object named cin of type iStream iterator of int, and the second parameter had no name <laughs> but was a function taking no arguments and returning an iStream iterator of int. That's what we call the most vexing pass problem because, in doubt, we consider this to be a declaration and not an expression so <laughs> I got crazy I mean this compiled and here I got the error message because I was not allowed to call size for V so the solution there was put additional parentheses around the declaration then this can no longer be a declaration of a function and you know what using uniform initialization we should thus just should have used curly braces here and everything would be fine because curly braces don't have the problem that they might be uh, interpreted as a function call which essentially is a problem here these are the most more interesting things there was just some plain benefits of curly, uh, curly braces for initialization for example curly braces disable narrowing so if you initialize an int by 7.8 this works this gives no warning this just initialize the int by 7 obviously uh, even with parentheses we adopted this rule and we fix that with curly braces so curly braces will detect what we call narrowing narrowing means we initialize something by a value but the value gets slightly narrowed so that it loses part of its information and that will no longer compile if you use curly braces another good reason to use curly braces to initialize an object and here's another example let's use an unsigned long and initialize it with a negative value which will work when we don't use curly braces but if we use curly braces this will not compile yeah, well if all the compilers do it right and the same is true for vector of int if we initialize a vector of int and we pass in doubles this will not compile because we use curly braces and only if yes 
the long, long example you brought, isn't it also an, uh, uh, an example for narrowing that didn't work? The long, long example I brought... With get it in? Long, long, with get in? Or with you, if you use curly braces, then uh, it doesn't accept an in. Also, LL is equal long. Auto LL equals long, long. Um, what does get in to John? But you can use an int as a long, long. Yeah. That's not a problem. That's not narrowing. Okay. Every integer value is representable as a long. It's the other way around. I should oh, not yeah. return a long, long and use it as an int. That would be narrowing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, not all compilers implement this correctly. Um, in GCC and Clang, you have to you turn on pedantic errors so that this is an error. The problem when I had this slide is I thought narrowing is always a problem. Somebody told me, no, that's not the case. Narrowing sometimes is great. Here's an example. If I have a character C initialized by the character A, this would not compile, but this is probably something I want to compile. So I want to initialize C1 by the next character, A plus 1. But the problem is because the C is a character and the 1 is an int, the result of the sum is an int, and if we use the int to initialize a character, we narrow its value. Steady cast. Steady cast, yes. <laughs> it's the solution. Do we like that? No, sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes we want to have just this. So there are, there are cases where maybe there are cases where we have application not to use the curly braces and their safety nest. So I don't claim always use curly braces. I'm talking about the question what I should teach to beginners. And they might use curly braces and in case the curly braces does not do the right thing, do something else. That's okay. We have other cases and we will see other examples here. Here's another problem. We have here a class X with three constructors. So the three constructors are and I and the string, two strings, or the initializer list of int. Well, the rules, which one is called, are not that easy to understand. The rules are for an initializer list, you have to use curly braces, otherwise, this is ignored. But if you use curly braces and you don't pass an argument, this will, if there is, call another default constructor if it's there. So in this case it's easy. 7 and string, that matches only here, that matches here, and this both calls the third constructor. But for initializer list you need curly braces, so you can't declare an object without taking just taking a value without curly braces. The default construction of this object will not work. So what happens if we have this? If we have a default constructor and we have a constructor taking an initializer list? Well, then the rules are, by default, the initializer list is constructor is taking using curly braces unless the list is empty. So that means if we declare something without curly braces, this constructor can't be called, only this. If we use curly braces, then it depends on how many arguments you have in this curly braces list. If this is empty, the first constructor is called. If there are values inside, this constructor is called. Note that for one integer, the other, the first, would also match. Yeah, there are reasons for this rule, but it's not easy to teach. And there are interesting consequences of this rule, which means an interesting consequence of almost everybody knows now, it's the following problem. If you have a vector of int, 
The vector of int could be initialized before C11 that way, saying I take 3 and 42, which has the semantics that 3 is the number of elements and 42 is the initial value of all these elements. So you could initialize an object, a vector, saying I have three elements all having value 42. And now we introduce the new constructor taking an initial list of elements with curly braces and suddenly this is totally different. This is initialize the vector with two elements, the first is 3, the other is 42. When I discuss this with people, they say, this is the proof that uniform initialization is broken. It's not. It's a proof that what we designed in C++ 98 is broken. Because ask people who don't know C++ what this expression does. Yeah, of course, we initialize a vector with two elements. They will have no clue that this does something different. So this is not self-explanatory, this is self-explanatory. And that means, what I say is, brace initialization is more self-explanatory than not using it. And that's important for decisions what to teach. Good. So as you have learned all this, now let's go and, add and use the rules we have. So let's initialize a vector, a vector of string, and use a couple of ways to initialize this. Are you all familiar with the rules here? I mean, yeah, you can't initialize with an equal sign without curly braces. Oh, with empty curly braces, we have to talk about that, we come to that later. You can pass this and this one or multiple elements to the string, but what happens if you use additional curly braces? Is this valid or not? You see the answer here already. So this is an error, this is okay, this is okay. And what is this? This compiles, but it's a fatal runtime error. Yes? The V05 is missing a brace. Yeah, how did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, you're right. <laughs> Can somebody send me an email afterwards that I fix this in the next slide, in the next talk? Okay, so this is, this is something interesting. Look at this. We have a vector of string and we initialize this vector of string with two values, but instead of putting here just the values, we put additional parent uh, braces here. What this means is you suddenly say these are two iterators because the type of a string literal is an array of characters which decays to be a pointer to the character. So these are two pointers and what we do here is we initialize the vector of string by saying I initialize this by all the elements from the address of the A to the address of the 2. Which at best gives you a core dump. At worst you get something really strange. So brace initialization is not always correct and fine and obvious. Nothing is. Good. And there's another benefit we had. Um, if you use enumerations, the only way to initialize an enumeration by a value, by an integral value, is to use direct initialization with curly braces. Nothing else compiles and is allowed. We introduced that, by the way, with C17. Before this, even this was not allowed. Okay. Last example, I gave this today at a training and they said, oh, um, I don't understand what's, hap what's going on here. This is a function object. You might have heard about that. This is objects that behave like functions or functions that have a state. There's nothing that doesn't exist in C++ and if it exists, there's, it's even worse. There's always a useful application of something crazy thing. And this is one application because this means 
we need a function and in the function we want to specify the behavior of this function. The function should take an int and multiply the int with a value and the value should be given to the function on the fly while we run the program. So we have it here, we have a value x and we say here we create an object, we initialize an object taking the x and that means we create a function that multiplies with x and then we call it. Is it easy to see the difference between these things? This is a declaration of an object, this is calling the function. Well, if you use braces, it's better. You see here, this is a declaration, this is a function call. Okay? Good. So, you see where I'm going to. I, I propose that brace initialization is better than anything else. So, should we use the equal sign or not? Well, we have to talk about explicit. Explicit means that you have no implicit type conversions. So, if you have a constructor being explicit, it says if your function takes an object of your type, you can't pass something that is implicitly converting to this. You have to explicit convert it. And the thing that drives a lot of people crazy is this, that this also matters in initializations. In initializations, if you use an equal sign, you need support for implicit conversions if the thing on the right has a different type. So, because we have this explicit here, I can't initialize C3 by 42. I have to convert it explicitly to a collection, but only because it uses an equal sign. Without the equal sign, it's fine. Is this something people understand? No. I once proposed to say, hey, initialization with an equal sign should behave like without an equal sign. They kicked me out of the room. <laughs> huh? But we have ways that this might be useful to have different behavior when we initialize an object because we want to sometimes support in, 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 in implicit conversion, sometimes we don't want. How could you provide that? That's for simplicity? <laughs> yeah, so no way, we have that. Okay, so this creates a, some interesting problems. If we have a collection and the collection takes an int and an initializer list of int and one of them is explicit and the other is not, you get this interesting behavior. You can call a function foo and if you pass an empty curly braces that will compile but with curly braces with something inside it will not compile because you learned it. Empty curly braces will call this constructor which is not explicit the others will call this constructor. And even worse, when we initialize this collection with an equal sign, using empty curly braces will compile, but not using, uh, using curly braces with the elements inside will not compile. Huh? So, okay, style guide, style guide. Use explicit consistently. So if you have a default constructor and you have an initializer list constructor, please either declare them both as being explicit or none of them being explicit. Okay? Side lesson learned. So why do I know that? Because I made, we made the mistake in the standard. We had in C++11 this declaration. We said this is a class vector. The constructor here takes an optional allocator. So this is also the default constructor and we have a constructor taking initializer list and look at that the default constructor is declared explicit, the other is not. Which meant that people pretty soon realized and sent back reports to GCC for example and said why does this compile but this not? We fixed that in C14 by the way so we split this into do being two constructors. So the default constructor now is consistent regarding explicit 
ness with the initial isolist constructor and um, not being explicit, but the, we don't want to have an implicit conversion from an allocator to a vector. Still, we don't want to have that. So, you might argue, let's use explicit of every time, because we want to make things explicit. Oh, beware a little bit. So if we have a person constructor here, and this is not explicit, you can do the following. Look at this. We have a function foo. We can return empty curly braces because we have default values for both. We can return the name and we can return a name and an ID and we don't have to convert this to a person. And here, when we initialize a vector of person, you can initialize every, it with everything, with an empty curly braces list, with a name, so with an existing um, string with uh, some values, etc. If we make this constructor explicit, everything becomes an error here. So that's fine. You might say, well, now we have to use explicit conversions here. But remember, if you initialize now a vector of collect, uh, collection that is a vector of persons, you can, uh, can't just pass something that converts to a person. And that will not everybody in your community will like that. Well, interestingly, in our standard, we are currently going into a different direction. We say, if somebody uses curly braces, they do that intentionally. But if they use something without curly braces, they might not do that intentionally. So currently we change the C++ standard to say we only have explicit for constructors taking one argument, for all the others we don't take them as being explicit, which means that this will compile and this will compile but this will not compile and here this in the middle will not compile but the things outside will compile. You can think about it as you like, I just want to point out that we currently go into a kind of a style guide that this is the way the standard types in the library support implicit conversions. <coughs> so, so let's look at the vector again as a summary. <laughs> is this all intuitive? Well, this was fixed. Here, with the empty curly braces, I told you we had a fix with explicit because of the equal sign we needed explicit fix. This now compiles. Uh, we talked about this fatal runtime error already. And here we have another couple of things that compile and don't compile. So you can not pass to a vector an int, a vector of string an int, fits with an allocator, but you can pass five strings all being six with an allocator, and this all doesn't compile. I don't want to discuss all the details here, but is this a consistent scheme you can easily teach to your programmers? Okay, and it's get worse. We are, we are not done yet, excuse me. How, how much time do I have? <laughs> a lot. A lot. <laughs> You will regret. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's finally, uh, close to being final, talk about aggregates. What is an aggregate? An aggregate is something that is not a class, but a structure. Well, we have this term from C. So it's, it's either a struct or an array or a combination of both. And we adopted that in C++ and said, we have, um, we have an aggregate if we have a class or an array with uh, no user declared constructors, no private protected or non static data members, no base classes, and no virtual functions. Then we have an aggregate. Why do I say that? Because the rules for aggregates are different, of course, to initialize that. In uh, C11 and 14, we modified this a little bit so you can now have user provided constructors. And in C17, we again change the definition of aggregates. So you can now have, um, it's not allowed to have explicit or inherited constructors, um, no virtual or 
protect the base classes but in general you can have base classes now so here base classes were not allowed now we allow them in aggregates so that means the following if you have code like this this was in C++ before C++ 17 this was a class and not an aggregate so if you have a base type data string and double and you derive from that I'm talking about this type because you derive from another type this was not an aggregate in C++ 17 this became an aggregate whether or not you have a print function here doesn't matter in both cases it's still an aggregate even if you have a function defined here it would not be an aggregate if you have a constructor defined here so the rules are you can now declare the object but you can also declare it with empty curly braces and if you use empty curly braces in an aggregate all the members are initialized by their default values including the fundamental data types get the value that corresponds with zero so this is now an aggregate and this will now work and initialize the object and uh, you can even because in C++17 this is an aggregate you can even use that to pass initial value to the base type so you can do this look at this you can initialize an object of this type saying the base type the name and the value get item and 6.7 and the derived type gets the false okay and you can skip the braces here that's a feature that's not a bug in the past to be able to do that you had to write a constructor taking all these arguments and this could not be supported only this could be supported or could not be supported easily everything can be done in C++ more or less complicated so a couple of things were surprising when we talked about aggregates look at this this is a class C having a constructor default constructor which is deleted so it's a user declared constructor but it's not provided it's not defined and you know what this was an aggregate so this was an error this was okay when I heard that I screamed <laughs> and I tweeted out this and the first answer was this is what the fuck of the month so how could we allow this this by the way was a side effect to support the application of atomics in C++11 with atomics we made everything wrong in C++11 we fix that all now over time and this will also be fixed now so here's another example here if you have an int taking and you say the, the constructor taking an int is deleted you could initialize it with curly braces taking an int <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, a pub, and, and, and when we discussed that and said this has to be fixed it's totally crazy they said but this is a nice way to force the initialization of an aggregate <laughs> <laughs> this is fixed for C20 with a document called P0118 it was an interesting discussion good I think I skipped this so there's one famous aggregate we have the famous aggregate we ever have in this standard which is std array std array um, to understand that you have to know that you could in C already define a structure of array so we have a structure and internally you have an array of 10 integer elements and for this array you could initialize this with the way to use equal sign and curly braces that's valid C code the only difference in C++ is that in C++ you no longer have to write the struct here again but you can 
And STD array is the templification of this idea. This is an aggregate and an STD array is just saying in this structure of an array we parameterize the type of the elements and the size of the uh, the number of the elements in this array. The funny thing is just because it's a template it's not changing the question whether it's an aggregate or not. It's still an aggregate. So therefore we could do this even before C++11. We didn't use an initializer list. We could do this. And we still can. And um, we just added a few functions like size so that we can ask the array for the size and the index operator so that we can use the index operator and an iterator types and begin and end so we can iterate over the array this, all this does not change the fact that this array is an aggregate and follow the rules of aggregates so why does this matter? well, a couple of things are different, first of all in an aggregate if you don't use curly braces the elements are not initialized. So if you have five integers in your array they are undefined values and not initialized with zero. It's the only container where we have that. But even worse, look at this. We have a vector of complex elements. So a vector of complex numbers. How do you initialize it with two complex numbers? You Declare it and say I initialize the first complex number to be real part 1 imaginary part 2 and the other is real part 1 imaginary part 4. Everybody understands that. Well, almost everybody. Now let's switch to an STD array here and this will not compile. Why that? Because this is not a class, this is an aggregate. And the aggregate works the following way. You can skip all curly braces except the outer pair, pair and then it's fine. But if you use multiple pairs, then things have to fit. And the problem is we have an array, excuse me, we have a structure. Internally in the structure we have an array and in the array we have elements. So from the view of an array, you need one additional pair of parentheses, uh, curly braces here which drives people crazy. I mean I started now to teach to say hey instead of raw arrays use, use std array oh great we have std array now I have a couple of vectors that have a fixed size with fixed elements I just switch to std array and suddenly they didn't compile. What happens to the rest of the values? The rest of the values in an array are initialized by zeros. That's guaranteed. So it's even worse. Look at this. I, have, I want to initialize my vector by at one complex number which is initialized real part one, imaginary part two. Let's switch to an array. This will compile. The problem is it will compile to something different because this says the first element in the array gets a value 1 and the second element in the array gets a value 2 because to give this as initial values to the first element we would need another pair of curly braces so this is essentially having this effect teach this to programmers. Just tell them we have vector, we have array, there's no problem. <laughs> Good. And finally I want to talk a little bit about class template argument deduction which is a new feature in C++ 11, uh, 17. So we now can say that instead of saying a complex number takes ints, so we have a complex number where real and imaginary parts are ints and we initialize that, you can skip saying what the template arguments are 
if they can be deduced from the constructor. So you can say now I have a complex initialized with 5 or 3, whether it's curly braces or parentheses. The compiler now deduces that the elements in the complex are ints because we initialize them within. So according to the constructor. And it follows the rules of the function templates, where we also don't have to specify what are the parameters. Good, and that's good. For example, here if you program a log guard, you no longer have to say that the log guard takes a mutex. It follows from the fact that you initialize the log guard with a mutex. Of course, I should use curly braces here. How could I provide this slide? So, how does it work with vector? Let's look into details in vector here. Vector is our favorite container. So, let's look how it works. The these are all constructors of vector. And if we declare something like a vector v1 taking with curly braces 8 and 15, remember or no, the vector does not, we don't say the vector takes ints as elements. We just specify 8 and 15 being ints. So how this is okay now, because this constructor is, is called, this constructor says I take an initializer list of t, and because this t is an int, we know now that this is a vector of int. The t can be deduced according to the constructor. And if we have one element, this also works. If we use parentheses, remember, this will not be used, this constructor. So we talk about this constructor, which takes a size, no, this one a size and an initial value. And because this is a size, this is a 8, and this 15, because this 15 is an int, then because of that, this vector is a vector of int. But if you don't place the initial value, just the size, by the size, you, we don't know what the type of the elements is, so we don't can deduce that. And the funny thing is, if you pass an empty <coughs> string as the element, this will also not compile because here we pass a string literal and this t is not taking the argument by value. If it would take the argument by value, it would deduce this as a decayed type. So the type const character one, so an array of one character will be converted to a pointer to a to a const, but because we pass it by reference, decay will not happen. And it tries to create a vector. It deduces that T is an array of one character, but a vector of an array of one character elements will not compile. So that doesn't work. Okay? So Let's try a couple of other things. Let's use a set of string. Oops, that was a wrong button. Maybe that's a hint I should end this talk. So we have a set of string and we can initialize a vector taking these, the begin of this collection and the end of this collection. Note that we use curly braces here. Curly braces mean these two are the two elements in the vector. So this is a vector of set iterators. Yes? So it's not always that curly brace initialization does what you think should be done. It's pretty easy. If you use curly braces, then this is a, these are elements, so my two elements are iterators. If I use parentheses, this will not happen. So brace initialization takes elements. That's the rule. Well, could we make somehow this happen so that we can say a vector of int or a vector takes an initial set of elements and the types are deduced? Yes, we can. We have something introduced called a deduction guide. A deduction guide here says, if I have a vector taking two iter iterators, here the A is wrong, please deduce 
that the vector should be a vector of the value type of the iterator. So by that we can say if the compiler deduces types wrong or can't deduce the type, here's a rule how to deduce the type of t. So if we pass to iterators, please take the iterator value type for, it, for this. And with that, note that the curly braces still say these are two elements, but now the parentheses will compile and deduce that this vector is initialized by all the elements of this set. Do you like that? I don't know. But things don't become less complicated with C++ 17. This, by the way, is a fully specified deduction guide, including iterators and uh, including uh, allocators. And we run into the following problem. If you have here a vector initialized with two strings, again, this is a vector of two character pointers with two elements. If we use the parentheses here, what's happened now? What's happening now? Here now we take this as to iterators. The iterator here is the begin. This is the end. So we initialize the vector by all constant characters because we point to characters between the string literal high and the string literal world in my program, wherever they are. If you are lucky, this will be a corda. If you are not lucky, this will be something worse. A couple of examples I gave you. Some of them were solved by brace initialization. Some of them got worse or non-intuitive behavior. Yes, we have that. We can't fix this language anymore. It's not possible. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a couple of other issues. I skipped that. That's not important. Well, maybe this one. I, this is funny. Um, if you use brace initialization, some t some suddenly assertions no longer work. Because assertions have an understanding of parentheses, but not of braces. So if you do that, and you have parentheses here, the assertion will understand that this is one expression. But if you use braces here, they don't understand that this is a grouping of two arguments, they just see the comma, the assertions, and say, oh, the first argument to the assert is everything up to the comma, and then we have a second argument to the assert that is everything behind the comma. So if you use assertions and you switch to brace initialization, you might need additional parentheses. We love C++. Summary. We came from a situation where I said we have different syntaxes and we have different terminology and multiple terminology and multiple rules. So we started with the idea make uniform initialization, provide uniform initialization. So make it, fix it so that all the people can use just one way to initialize things. Which to some extent works, but uniform initialization increases, increases the mess because we are backward compatible. And the only way to solve this problem is come up with style guides. Because the only other option is teach all the beginners and programmers the mess. And I'm pretty sure if you have programmed here in C++ for a couple of years, you were, you were surprised by some of my slides today. So, I claim the best way to teach, to initialize an object in C++ now, is to use uniform initialization. So, use this way, we detect narrowing, it's self-explanatory if we initialize a vector of two elements, auto it was fixed with C++ 17, unless you use the equal sign. Huh enums work and in any type 
empty curly braces work now and can be used and non-empty curly braces also even with aggregates with the fixes we do in C++20. So by default prefer uniform direct initialization that means with curly braces and without the equal sign. I don't claim that you should always use it. The question is what should we teach? And where should we start with by default? This has interesting consequences because when we discussed that at BMW and said do we really want to teach this rule? Look at this. They were used to, well some of those who already did C and C++ programming, they were used to use it that way to initialize an array here and, and, and it loop over an end initializing an auto or initialize or calling a constructor or an initializer list having an initializer list excuse me in a derived class so they were used to program that way and we were saying change that if you have an int initialize it with curly braces if you have a loop look at this look at this if you have a loop you want to iterate from 0 to 32, initialize the i with curly braces until you come to 32. This was the trickiest part. This was a question, I, do you really want to teach that? Which means C programmers are, bro are, are confused, which might be a good thing. <laughs> It's an interesting experience we had there because with this way of teaching to use curly braces everywhere, really everywhere when you initialize something unless something does not work correctly, you need some special behavior that is not possible with curly brace initialization. It turned out that over time, after two months, I got used to it and I felt a smell when people did no longer use curly braces. So there seems to be an idea that part of the problem we have with using curly braces is that we are not used to it. I can just say it from my personal experiment. I mean I do C++ programming for 25 years and more. I switched to initialization with curly braces at the beginning of this year. And now I'm feeling bad if I don't use curly braces here. I still use equal signs, don't worry. <laughs> but I feel bad. <laughs> so that means here we use curly braces and even if you initialize objects, for example passing variant uh, objects uh, arguments to base classes, use curly braces here. That's what we teach. Is it the right way to teach? I don't know. I'm just talking about a style guide. And this style guide might be wrong. And in fact, that we have a problem, you can see because Herb Sutter made a research. It ha he has an inventory of 700 rules of guidance from books and coding standards. And it turned out of this 700 rules, 5% care about in the proper initialization. So we have an issue there. But we have different opinions in the community. My opinion is not the common opinion. Definitely not. A lot of people in C++ community, especially those standardizing C++, hate uniform initialization. Because they are experts. The argument roughly goes the following. But if it's an ag aggregate, you know that you have to use braces. And if it's a class, you know that you have to use parentheses. So what's the problem? <laughs> well, the problem is you might not care whether it's an aggregate or a class or not. <coughs> That's the whole point. So read about it, app sale. App sale is uh, the C++ style guides from Google, which they now provide as to the public, to the community, as saying these are the style guide to follow programming in C++. So they have a style guide about 
practices for initialization. So they claim direct uniform initialization has two shortcomings. Uniform is a stretch. There are cases where ambiguity still exists. Yes, that's right. This syntax is not exactly intuitive. And their argument is not. In a couple of places I told you that the curly braces are more intuitive than using parentheses. Their argument is in every other language parentheses are used. Which is a valid argument. And this I found a little bit funny. The important question is how much should we change our habits? The benefits outright the drawbacks. We don't think that this is the case. So they recommend exactly the different. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I give you the task to put this together. <laughs> so they propose exactly the difference, that what I propose here. That in itself is a problem. Because we have now the situation that we have a mess and too much complexity in C++ and we don't have consistent recommendations about style guides. Scott Myers is gone. I mean, he doesn't write books anymore. <laughs> so nobody is writing books about style guides with some authority. And that's a problem. Well, we have... Um, by the way, the app say people say, this is the easy style guide we have. Use the assignment syntax when initializing directly with the indented literal value with smart pointers such as shared pointer, unique pointers with containers. When performing struct initialization or doing copy initialization. Use the traditional constructor syntax with parentheses when initialization is performed. Uh -huh. Use pearly braces without the equal sign, only if above or since don't compile, never mix. Is this, this is an easy style guide. I want to show this in the second hour of my C++ training to the people saying you should follow this guide to initialize an object. The CPP core guidelines are a little bit better. They follow my advice. They say, well, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> Cut this off this tape. <laughs> oh my goodness, they will kill me. Um, prefer the brace initialization syntax and they have they have this nice sentence old habits die hard <laughs> yeah so yeah some people need need longer than others to get used to this thing <laughs> so yeah we have a style guide we have five percent the problem is the next step is make the style guides uniform <laughs> that's an interesting cast how to do that I have no answer for that. We are thinking about having a special group about teaching C++. And they are to some extent thinking about that I have to be involved somewhere there. I said no way. I have to be there when you standardize crazy stuff I have to teach. This is, don't get me wrong, this is a, a group of very smart people. And they are very well, very nice. We run into the problem that we are two good experts. And they don't see about the problems the ordinary programmer has when using C++. And it's getting worse and worse. It's really getting worse and worse. I have problems now to follow what comes with the new standard. Because we have five working groups and we extend now to eight working groups that at the same time evolve the language. And how do you get the idea that you have a consistent picture of the whole language and you don't see a problem that some things are broken? We get a mess, the mess gets worse. So it's time to switch to a new language. Oh, did I say that? No. <laughs> Too bad. Maybe not. It's the language we have. And there's no other language that uh, is as successful and appropriate. But we have a problem. So we should, we, we try to make initialization uniform. Remember that we still solve the problems of uniform initializations even in C20, which is nine years after we introduced uniform initialization as a concept. So we made a couple of mistakes, 
and we fix them from time to time and don't get me wrong but a couple of proposals to fix broken uniform initialization were, were driven by me because it's very cool to provide new features it's not cool to clean up existing broken things that's a problem we have we need more people who are interested to fix this language so welcome to C++ standardization if you can and the next thing is we have to consolidate the style guides I see I have some problems with C++ as you probably see um, I would never discuss an issue is this a good language or not it's a language I know, it's a language I learn, I can teach but we have a significant problem too much complexity, too much expert knowledge necessary to use this language and that's something that will will become worse and worse I see all the things that change the change of C++ 20 and 23 will be bigger than the change to C, change to C++ 11 we will dramatically change the way we program in C++ but we are backward compatible <laughs> <laughs> so that's it if you want to have some information about this um, some facts, that's the advertisement part I write some books for my living so please buy them <laughs> it's a standard library is, and the C++ the com 17 the complete guide and the second edition of C++ templates um, just one word to C++ 17 the complete guide this book is written a in an agile way so that means it's not Oh, it's not done yet but you can already buy it <laughs> as a PDF and you will get the updates for free it already has seven, uh, 300 pages uh, but I'm still trying to finish it and um, yeah so you can get it and all the updates for free the later you buy it the more expensive it will be get so. <laughs> okay that's an experiment that's it Thank you very much for your attention. And I think thank you. And I think we have some time for questions. Okay. Anybody able to ask something? <laughs> um, there's also a kind of initialization um, for. Uh, by doing a make pair or make unique point, uh, make unique these kinds of, but there's for example no make array, especially um, I needed it for uh, a, a, a standard array, which um, I didn't want to put in the, the the size of the array because it's clear how how large it is, like in C array, and it's not possible. Yeah, the question is we have a lot of makers. So make pair, make shared pointer, etc. So that, that create an object um, and do some, some, deduce some things. Um, to some extent, we no longer need them. To some extent, because we have class template argument deduction. And for example, if you use an STD array now, you can declare it now in C17 not using the um, angel brackets so not specifying the type and not specifying the number of elements mm -hmm. just initializing it by a certain number of values and class template argument deduction will deduce both the element type and the number of elements so that's that's there. So a couple of make pairs are no longer necessary, or make functions are, not, are, long, no, are no longer necessary. There are some exceptions because some makers um, do some additional stuff. For example, they decay the type. And therefore, sometimes you still need make pair or make share because they do something else. So, in principle, if you complain about what's missing or not, my answer is this is driven by the community we all do it for free or are paid by our companies but nobody pays us for to do the work that's why we don't have a chief architect so 
if you complain about missing something, I come back and say it's your fault. Because you haven't been there, proposing it, and fixing it. The only problem is, we now have said it so often, that we, our group to standardize C++ grew from formally 50 to 150 people. And we don't want to have more people bringing in new ideas. <laughs> because we can't handle them, that's all. We are overwhelmed by new proposals and new directions. Um, so I'm not sure which guidance I should say, but partially your problem will be solved with C++ 70. There's a proposal for it, yeah. but not that kind. Uh, I, li I would have liked to, um, to be the way. It's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, so the question is, there's a proposal and I would like to have it a little bit different. Don't underestimate the amount of corner cases and the impact of corner cases we have. So we have a lot of use cases and the moment you start to think about it a little bit closer and think about corner cases, you run into deep nightmares. And the problem is, usually you might not see the nightmares but maybe in five years you see that. And then people will complain, how could you do that? So um, in, in general, I think this group that standardizes C++ is very well and knows a lot. They don't know everything and don't know all the consequences. But um, sometimes there are good reasons we don't accept something. Any other question? Yes? In the picture that you show about the, the C++ 17, when you declare a still vector without angle brackets, if you pass only one parameter with parentheses and it's an integral, that wouldn't compile, isn't it? Yes. The question was, um, if I declare, um, if I use the the class template argument deduction, let's go to it, and declare vector. So you talked about this line. So you declare a vector and you only pass the size. Yeah. Was that the question? Yeah, yeah. That's and you and the question was why it doesn't why it is an error or what was the question? No, 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 no. I see. Okay, I didn't use this line. Okay, because of the number, no, that it cannot go to the size. Today. No, this is this does not compile because of this is narrowing. This is because we have no way here to find out what the element type is. Because this is calling this constructor here. And in this constructor, there's no way to deduce the type T, the element type. So you have no argument where we can learn what the element type is. The 8 is the type of the number of elements, which is not the element type. So therefore, this can't compile. Question? If I assign two size t arguments to the vector with curly braces or parentheses? <laughs> so if, if it's curly braces, um, then probably, I, well, I have to think, but I have to, I, I'm not sure unless I compile it. But I think this is a list of two, well, well two, no, you said two. Two size t iterates. So remember that initializer list constructors are have higher priority than ordinary constructors. So if this, if you use brace initialization, this will probably fit and be taken. So you initialize an a vector with these two elements. If you use brace initialization, then um, any other constructor has to be taken. It might be this one. But in this one, we can't deduce type T unless we have the deduction guide. So with the deduction guide, when we introduce the deduction guide, we said, um, if you give me two iterators, the value type of the iterator, so where the iterators refer to, will be the type T of this element. And that would... The line below the second explicit here. 
So if I pass, let me see, if I pass two size t, welcome to the world of overload resolution. Okay. <laughs> overload resolution means we first find out what could compile and then we have to decide if multiple things can compile, which has higher priority than others. And the rules are not always easy and sometimes they are not intuitive. So I can only guess, but I would guess that this is size t, this is const t reference. And the other is taking two elements of size t. This doesn't need any type conversion at all. This needs const t reference. I don't know, maybe it's ambiguous. <laughs> but there are no iterator traits, right? Mm. Or oh, there are no iterator traits, so this can't be compiled, yeah, so... Uh, I agree with you. Okay, let's... Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. If you don't know, don't compile that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Um, so on um, slide 13 you had... Um, 13? 13, yes. You still remember what I wrote in slides 13? Only because I wrote it down. <laughs> okay, slide 13. It, uh, you said that initializer list auto would be required. Um, can, can we have um, template argument deduction guides for our initializer list and then get rid of this yeah. funny requirement? So the question is, do we have alternatives to this? Yeah. With, with template argument deduction. With template, template argument deduction, but still with argument template. Ah, you mean, you mean that I skip this here yeah. and only write here initializer list. Yeah. Initializer list. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we have to ask Richard Smith, who is the authority in, in the core language. Yeah, you see, I have no clue about C++, I only complain. <laughs> so you got the message right. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm here around the LibCon visit. Thank you very much.